Hi everyone, Ian Aldridge here from Progressive Legal CPD. Today we're talking to the guys from Foundry IP, uh, Dr. Andrew Jones and Lester Miller. They're both registered trademark and patent attorneys. Uh, they're gonna be talking today about the demise of the innovation patent, um, why you need to tell all in, uh, in a patent application, as well as some clarity around um, the new changes that are coming in relation to design laws and um, patents as well. So really interesting topic today. I hope you um, enjoy it, get a lot out of it. Um, here it is. Hello everyone, uh, my, my name's Andrew Jones. Uh, I'm here with my colleagues, Lester Miller and Kieran Power, uh, the guest of uh, Ian, your wonderful host. Um, we're gonna split the talk up today and uh, talk about uh, a couple of different topics that are sort of, I guess, hot in the patent world at the moment. Uh, the first is the, uh, the demise of the innovation patent. Uh, the second, Lester will handle his proposed changes to Australian design laws. Uh, I'll then talk about why you need to tell all when you're filing a patent application. And then Kieran will finish up with patentable subject matter and computer implemented inventions. So I'll just launch straight into it uh, and talk to you about the, uh, the long, slow goodbye to the unique, un the unique beast that is the Australian innovation patent. Um, so I guess this has been on the cards since, uh, since about 2013-14, um, when a number of government uh, initiatives or government-led reviews um, were starting to question the, uh, the, the value of the innovation patent. Uh, and basically since about 2017, there's been a pretty concerted uh, effort to abolish it. Um, that has been fought by uh, IPTA, the Institute of Patent and Trademark Attorneys and other, um, uh, other industry groups. Uh, but, and we managed to hold them off until about until last year when this all changed. So just quickly, uh, innovation patents, um, they were introduced to, uh, with great fanfare in, uh, back in 2001 uh, with the stated intention of encouraging innovation uh, you know, with SME, Australian uh, type businesses and organisations. Um, they have an eight year term, uh, which is compared to the 20 year term for a standard patent. Um, they require that the invention have something called an innovative step which is a significantly lower threshold than the inventive step required uh, of standard patents. So they're, you know, they're for so-called second tier inventions. Uh, and importantly, they're quick and easy to obtain. You don't have to undergo substantive examination uh, until such time as um, uh, you want to enforce them. So you can file them, they sit on the register for up to eight years and they don't ever need to be examined if you don't ever need them. So there are, a relatively quick, cheap, and easy uh, way to, um, uh, to, to, to get patent protection. Um, when they were first uh, launched, there was a bit of uh, controversy and uh, perhaps very unhelpfully, uh, the 12th innovation patent filed uh, included the following claim. I won't read it out to you, but maybe you can read it in your own time. But basically, a smart aleck patent attorney uh, wasn't particularly impressed with the innovation patent system and filed a patent that claims a wheel uh, and uh, subsequently spoke to the media about that and there was all kinds of um, all kinds of excitement in the media and with IP Australia and uh, you know patent attorneys uh, about the fact that somebody in 2001 had uh, got a patent for the wheel. IP Australia very quickly revoked that patent which wasn't widely reported uh, and but it still sits on the register I guess as a um, yeah, uh, a reminder of what they were. Um, so the innovation patent, um, as I say, IP Australia fell out of love with the innovation patent, as a, and I've said in the late noughties there, but it wasn't, it was, it was a bit later than that, as I say, about, about 2015, I guess. And there was a whole uh, succession of economic reviews that focused on the, uh, the aspects of um, uh, innovation patent filing data that led to uh, the conclusion by, you know, by the people that were doing these reviews uh, that they weren't being used by Australian SMEs. And examples that were given, you know, was in 2018, the largest filer of innovation patents was Apple, Apple Inc., obviously not an Australian SME. Uh, a very high proportion of the uh, innovation patents that are filed uh, expire after two years when the first renewal fee, $110 worth, isn't paid. Uh, only a very small fraction of innovation patents are ever certified. So, you know, of, of, you know hundreds of innovation patents uh, that get filed and get granted, only you know, uh, you know, ten percent or something of those are actually examined. Uh, and IP Australia noted that there were lots and lots of uh, first, first uh, one-time users, as they described it. So these people that would only ever file one innovation patent, 
Uh, and also, you know, we need to acknowledge that it was some abuse of the system. Um, you know, patent attorneys filed patents for wheels, and uh, a lot of um, people filed patents for things that weren't inventions for other other reasons. Uh, and an IP Australia's uh, report, recent report of uh, 2020, um, uh, they sort of explained why it was that they decided to uh, chop the innovation patent. Um, I guess from, from my perspective, um, you know, there were other aspects of the data that, you know, sort of said that maybe innovation patents weren't as bad, aren't as bad as, uh, you know, it was, was being made out. Um, so in 29, 2019 rather, over half of innovation patent applications were filed by Australian entities. And that compares with, you know, less than 10% uh, of, of standard patent applications. Uh, the numbers aren't directly comparable, you know, the innovation patents number in the thousands, uh, you know, standard patent applications number in the tens of thousands, but still they are proportionally more used by Australians. Uh, there was very, very strong support by SME representative groups, uh, including, as I mentioned, uh, ICTA, Institute of Patent and Trademark Attorneys, uh, who, you know, perhaps have a vested interest, but also OS Biotech, the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry and the Business Council of Australia all opposed uh, the abolishment of the uh, innovation patent, and you know, despite um, uh, you know, despite claims to the contrary, there are only you know less than a hundred um, reports, uh, you know, work was sort of filed as part of this consultation period, and you know, given that there's tens of thousands of SMEs uh, in Australia, um, you know, I don't think you could uh, claim that there's a very wide consultation. Uh, I've included here a uh, a quote from Senator Rex Patrick. Um, Sort of, I guess, given in a bit of disgust after uh, the the innovation patent um, abolition bill had um, had uh, passed through the Senate, uh, I won't read it out. But um, whenever I'm feeling a bit down, I always look at that quote because I, I just quite like <laughs> I quite like what it says and I quite like uh, what it what it conveys. And so, and so, what was it so good about the innovation patent? That... What was so good about it? Yeah, um, look, yeah. In our experience, you know, we, um, you know, we're a small IP law firm. We represent the small end of town. We have, uh, you know, probably hundreds of SMEs who are our clients, and we file innovation patents all the time. They love them. They're great. They're quick and easy to obtain. Um, the initial costs to file the patent application, you know, a standard patent application or an innovation patent application are about the same because it's all about preparing the patent specification. But then with innovation patents, you file them and you, it's done. Whereas with a standard patent application, you've got examination, you've got you know, rounds of arguments with examiners, you've got the acceptance fees, you've got uh, you know, five years of you know, three or up to five years worth of examination. So they're a much simpler and easier thing to obtain. And eight years is you know, for, for second tier inventions is, is plenty. People don't need a full 20 year term by the time they get to eight years. Um, you know, they're on to the second generation or the third generation of this and it doesn't cover the, um, the you know, it doesn't cover the original product anymore. So they don't need a 20-year patent. Uh, they, they want an eight-year patent and want one that can be obtained quickly. And, and that's been one of the things that, um, you know, the, the government say about patent attorneys, you know, um, we're self-interested in, in sort of like, you know, pushing to maintain the innovation patent. But my argument against that has always been that, we, we make less money in the end out of uh, innovation patents than we would, you know, out of a heavily contested standard patent. Um, that they, you know, I, I'm saying with you know, complete honesty, they are great for, great for our clients. And, and just, you know, fast until time, some protection. Yeah. And, and, yep, um, yep, yep. In a month, you have a granted patent unless there's, unless there's sort of formality issues, but, you know, they're pretty rare. And eight years are a really long time in small business. Exactly, exactly. To exploit the market and yep. they don't need that extra protection. Yep, yep. Sometimes, sometimes you have clients that have products and they, you know, they, they insist you file an innovation patent and eight years comes around and they're saying, oh, oh we'd, like, we'd like a few more years. Is there anything we can do? Um, of course, there's not, but, you know, but, but still they've had eight years and, and you know, are relatively cheap in the scheme of things patent. Yeah. Um, so as I say, to no avail, um, uh, and, and from 26th of August 2021, it will no longer be possible to file a new innovation patent. Um, there'll be options to convert patents that, that were filed before that date uh, into innovation patents. So, you know, in theory, the last innovation patent will lapse on 26th August 
2029, but, uh, but we'll see whether it lasts that long. Um, so just, just quickly, um, I guess there's, you know, there's a big, now a big hole in the, um, you know, the, the patterns landscape. And as part of the negotiations in the Senate, the government agreed to carry out a review, you know, uh, for, uh, to try and improve SME's accessibility to, to the patent system. And uh, an emeritus professor, um, Mortley, um, has been asked to carry out this review. And that, that's actually under, underway now. Uh, and if people want to make submissions to that, you know, if any of your clients have, you know, SM, any people listening to this lecture or your clients, you know, are SMEs that are involved in innovation, I would strongly encourage people to, to have their say here. Um, you know, it, it's, it, you know, it would be good for, for, you know, that side of the Australian market uh, at the SME size to, to, to hear about, um, you know, to, 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 to make sure the government hears their opinions. Uh, that's the end of uh, my little uh, spiel on the innovation page, moving on to, uh, to Lester's side of things. Thanks, Andrew, for that. Okay. Are you, Lester? Hello. All right. Uh, my name is Lester Miller. And I'm a patent attorney at Foundry, and uh, thanks, Ian, for for this opportunity to, to chat. Um, Welcome. Thanks so much for, for taking the time, both of you, again, um, out of your day to, to talk about this stuff. It's um, it's great to um, great to have you. Yeah. Well, thanks. Um, look, uh, when there are there are going to be some big changes coming up to designs law. Quite gigantic changes to the, to the designs law in our country. Um, uh, at least tangible, and uh, they'll, they'll, they'll further harmonise our uh, designs law with uh, some of our other major trading partners. Um, IP Australia right now is uh, conducting a holistic uh, review of the designs law, and um, for the first thing that they did in this in this review was to get some quick wins. And their quick wins were to uh, implement some recommendations uh, which were made in 2015 by ACIP uh, and accepted in, in the, uh, that year by the government. And there's an exposure draft available of the bill and the explanatory memorandum. And comments are still open until tomorrow for the exposure draft bill and the explanatory memorandum. Um, the, 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 some of the criticisms of the Designs Act so far, and there have been many uh, of this act and um, the previous act, uh, you know, people say, pe people say all the time, users of the system say, I thought I had some protection, it turned out I had nothing. And uh, um, also, you know, I didn't, I didn't know about the design system. Uh, and when I found out, I found out everything was too late to do anything about it. I'd already and published it and it's already out there. And right. And, and, uh, if anyone, and if anyone sort of changes things, even by just a slight, yeah, you know, exactly slightly, then it doesn't cover you. Yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, yeah, I couldn't make any amendments <laughs> and, uh, even in, even in, in today's world where, you know, technology, I mean, where Australians have a lot of, a lot of skills in technology and computer apps and, um, you know, designs law sort of was irrelevant to my, to my business, uh, which I thought, you know, which, and um, so some of these, some of these changes do address some of those inflexibilities in the system, which is great. Uh, the headline act really is uh, the grace period. Uh, as we were saying, you know, you find out about the designs law system, you find out you can file something and it's, it's, it's too late, but it's not going to be too late when this act comes in uh, because we'll have a 12 month grace period. If you, if you did uh, or your client did uh, make, a, make a public disclosure of their design in the previous 12 months, they will be able to still Mon get get a monopoly for their design for ten years. Yeah, well, it's a it's a it's a big grace period, isn't it, compared to, yeah. um, say, for instance, Andrew with you know with patents and um, I think there's what six um, six months. What is it uh, with a patent? 
Oh, no, the, the, there's, there's a couple of different grace periods for pain mm. and, uh, and, and there is actually now a general 12-month grace That's period true. as well for, for patents. Uh, you, you get some funny exemptions for, for six months, but um, by and large, they've been, uh, you know, been uh, changed now. It's been superseded by the 12-month grace period. Yeah, in, excellent. In, in Japan, for example, there is a six-month grace period and a lot of other countries for designs do have six-month grace periods. But um, Europe and the US um, have 12-month grace periods, so we're matching them. And um, it, uh, I guess... It seems to be a significant grace period for a for design for a, for a design. I mean, you can understand with a, with with a pattern um, that would be yeah. you know, need for having a, a that sort of twelve month period. But um, I suppose I suppose that's true. But um, what happens? I suppose is that I mean, what what comes out in these in these reviews is that almost nobody knows about the registered design system. So uh, it's it's very difficult for them to for it to come across their radar. <laughs> and so uh, you know, they just sort of I guess. They might hear about it once or twice and then uh, and forget about it. But then the third time, maybe they might they might do something about it. And by then, it might be twelve months, which 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 will be good enough uh, to get. I mean, um, it's a good start, uh, but it's it's not a catch all. Uh, what you what you can't do is to file a foreign application, say in Europe, and then wait twelve months to file in Australia, because you'll be out of time. You have to rely if, if you are if you are that if you are that much aware of the of registered design as to file one in Europe say, well, the government wants you to uh, observe the Paris Convention uh, deadlines and file within six months of the, of the European application. But what they don't want is two different priority dates for the same design. So um, uh, foreign, foreign publications by, or, or even Australian publications by a registered design organisation, by a governmental organisation is uh, excluded from the, registered, from the grace period. Um, uh, so what will that mean in practice for them? How will they, how will they do that? They need to do it at the same time. Uh, you'll need to, you need to, if, if you file overseas, uh, you'll have to file within six months of that application being filed. Right. Okay. So it'll be a period where you can claim the earlier priority date. Exactly right. Kind of like what you do with trademarks and if you're applying overseas for that, you'll get the growth period. Exactly right. Some clients do want to file overseas first, um, um, for various reasons. Um, uh, it was, what, a, it was what, a larger market, perhaps, and exactly right. They don't, they don't mm. want to spend money. They don't want to spend money in Australia until they've proved the design overseas mm. uh, has com has commercial uh, viability. Um, uh, the what, what this comes with is a prior user defence. So if you if you if if someone sees your design uh, in the marketplace and they think, well, I'd like to I'd, li I'd like to make that, and they check the designs register, nothing there. Uh, well, they can go and they can go and make that thing, and they, they'll have a defence against infringement even if you file a registered design application later. Uh, and uh, there's, there's a bit of sort of tightening up about that, that, that uh, people that the government's asking for clarification on now, for example, uh, if, you, if, if I did file a registered design application, uh, it, it won't be published for a while and they're sort, of, they're sort of seeking consultation on whether to, you know, uh, to have have sort of uh, remedies for that sort for the for the infringement that happens in between that time and and the time that it's published. Um, there's, there's there's some other complexities about design registrations which are being removed. For example, there's no publication or registration, and we just we just it just automatically gets published in in a few months' time after being filed, and also um, exclusive licensees. Uh, that will, will now be available, uh, able to sue, whereas they had to previously had to rely on the owner. Uh, Andrew, next slide, please. Um, these new these changes here are, are sort of uh, pending. Perhaps they they're not they're not, not going to go in this legislative package, but they will. They are they are on IP Australia's policy register, and IP Australia is seeking comment from people now. Uh, we did mention before about um, apps and uh, icons on screens. For example, they're not available for registered design in Australia. Um, they're not available for protection. Uh, for example, this one by PepsiCo, they had a lot of, they, they, had, they have a vending machine which, these, which has these kind of, if you, want a, if you want a cherry soda, you can press the cherry button here. Uh, not available for, for uh, 
uh, registered design protection in Australia because it's not subject matter that can be protected. It's not a, it's not a thing. It's not a thing that, man, that can be manufactured or handmade. Uh, and next slide, please. And here we have just for fun uh, in 2016. This 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 this, uh, this stuff is available for protection in, in the US. It was granted in the US in 2006 or seven, and was granted uh, was was awarded the electronic. Uh, something frontier, what do they call it? The EFF, the, uh, the, uh, the stupid pattern of the month, December 2016. Um, but they did, but Microsoft sued Corel and they got uh, $278,000 for Corel's uh, implementation of this in their software. Um, you know, that was, uh, this, is, this, this, is the, this is the kind of thing that, uh, that, a good, that a good patent attorney, a good design lawyer can actually um, can can get for you clients. Wasn't so, so stupid. Sorry. Wasn't so stupid. <laughs> Wasn't so stupid. That's right. That was, was a good. Two hundred seventy-eight thousand reasons. That's an excellent. All uh, right. I mean, I'm, I'm I'm all for it. I love this uh, this, this this Zoom slide. You know, we can't we can't imagine software without this kind this little this little Zoom slider now. But uh, back in two thousand six, you know. Um, next slide, please. Uh, again, nothing in this legislative package for this, but it, it, it is open for comment. Uh, partial designs. In Australia at the moment, we can't uh, get protection for uh, partial designs. We have to have the whole design considered, even though in the, the right-hand example, uh, uh, protection would be sort of focused on the, on the, on the uh, solid-lined parts. Um, less, less weight would be provided, would be... Would be um, would be given to the to the dash parts, but it's still a whole the, the uh, section 19 of the Act says that we have to consider the entire uh, product when you when you when you when you're looking at infringements and, and novelty. So uh, in the US, for example, that would just be that little bit um, the solid part would, would be would be all you'd consider. Um, and so uh, yes, if you if you do have comment for yourself or your clients, then that's available now in, in the policy register to make. Uh, next slide, please. Some other, some final things for tightening up in the act. The, the, in this legislative package are that fraud and false suggestion can be, uh, can be found during the certification process. If you say, you know, something um, misleading there, um, a pattern can be revoked, a design can be revoked, and some other things which are just sort of tightening up around the edges if you if you if you if you, uh, if you miss the design, if you miss the renewal payment, uh, the design doesn't cease during the grace period. It just kind of it just kind of is in a bit of a holding. It, it's still alive. Yeah. It won't it won't lapse until after the end of the grace period when you have to file a uh, section. What is it? Two two three. It's not two two three in the Designs Act, but it's seventy four or something like that now. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, uh, and. Some other timing things up are coming. You know, we're not going to call it registered design until it's been certified. Now, until it's been, in fact, in fact, the word registration may actually disappear. We might just call it a certified design or an uncertified design. So, I think that's all we've got for this change of the Designs Act. Thank you, Andrew. So it'll be then called what a certified design. Well, yes, I think it might be called. I'm not, I'm not sure whether they're going to drop the entire uh, registra the word registration yet because it is, you know, it's been used for so long and everyone understands yeah. what that means. The people who do understand or have heard of the Designs Act, that's, yeah. what, that's, what, we, that's what we call it. But, uh, uh, yeah, but it, might, it might well be just called uh, certified design or an uncertified when, design. When, when, do we, when, do you, when do we think it's going to come in? Uh, this is probably not for a few, for a few months yet. There's no, there's no timetable yet for mm. that. But... Uh, on, on the website of YP Australia, it says it's sort of on hold, comment being sought. And, you, and usually, what sort of time frame do they, they, they take for consideration before they, before they well, um, finally? I would say. Are we, when, when are we looking at the ultimately the changes kind of coming into, into force, perhaps? For the, for the present legislative package? Yeah. I think, I think uh, well, usually there's six months after, uh, after the second reading, but um, mm. I, don't know, I, I don't know when the second reading is going to be. Um, so that might be a while. Mm. Yeah. Might, I mean, the, the exposure draft, 
I, mean, I looked. I, I tried to look up the, the legislative. I did, I did look up the legislative procedure just now. There, there's no time frame between no. between 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 exposure draft. In fact, exposure draft is pretty rare. But um, there's there's no actual time frame between the exposure draft and first reading. Great. Well, mm. at least we'll uh, we've got a bit more time to, to consider that other you know as opposed to the uh, innovation patent, which is obviously much further along. It's yeah, done and done and dusted. Mm. Thanks, Lester. Pleasure. So moving along, um, the other part, sorry, Ian. Yeah, uh, okay, so we got the secret sauce. Yeah, it's still the secret sauce. What um, is, what's the secret sauce? Yes, this, this is a bugbear of mine. I, I'm a, I practice quite a lot of my practices in the chemical fields. And, you know, if I had a dollar for every single time a client has said, oh, you know, but Andrew, that's the, that's the secret sauce. That's, you know, that's what makes it work. That's the, that's the smarts. Do I really have to, you know, disclose that in the patent application, knowing that it will be published in, you know, 18 months time. Uh, and, you know, the answer is always the same. Yes, you do. Uh, and I want to talk today, um, uh, ultimately, about a, a particular case that, um, so that came out at the end of last year that uh, is, a, uh, is a, you know, horrific uh, reminder as to why you do need to spill the secret sauce. But, they, but, but those products like... Uh... Um, I saw a great, um, great program on um, Worcestershire sauce and how, <laughs> and, and how that's made. They were, they were only able to show, you know, so many of the ingredients, um, you know, in what order, and they were, you know, very, very conscious of uh, not giving away, the, you know, too much of the pro. Well, giving away enough of the process to show uh, perhaps how hard it is and what uh, the lengths that they go to and the fermentation um, process and, and all the rest. But there were some significant pieces of information that were kind of left and they said, sorry, we're not, we're not allowed to say anything more about this, this, and this, and this, and this, because um, then, then that would kind of really give, give it, give it all away. And that's, um, that's the, the closely held um, secret. Completely. And that's, and that's, you know, often one of the first questions I have with, you know, clients when we're talking about these inventions is, you know, do you want to patent it? Uh, can you keep this as a trade secret? And, you know, sometimes the answer is yes. You know, this is the, uh, you know, supposedly, you know, this, this is the, you know, ingredients that make up Coca-Cola. Um, and if you, if you file a patent application for it in 18 months' time, the world will know or, you know, or can find out if they're interested, uh, you know, exactly what's in the secret sauce, what the ingredients are. Uh, but if you can hold that, keep that as a trade secret, you never have to disclose that. That's not... That's not, um, you know, something that you're obliged to do. Although I think in this modern world with, you know, the, the chemical analyses that can be done of, of pretty much anything. Um, you well, know, I'm, not, I'm not sure whether everyone, you know, knows the 11 secret herbs and spices of KSC. We know probably there's, there's salt, there's pepper, there's probably chicken <laughs> salt. Lots of salt. Um, <laughs> we don't know what, what all the rest no, are. Ex exactly, exactly. Yeah, as I say, that's the first question, you know, do you... Do you want to keep this secret? Can you keep it secret? Mm. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, otherwise, but yes, because so, otherwise, you have to you have to disclose it um, to obtain yeah, protection. Yeah, yeah. Right? And, and you know, and, and this case I'll talk about shortly that it, you know leaves no doubt that you do have to disclose it, and there are some pretty um, you know pretty uh, horrific in the context of it uh, consequences uh, for the patentee. Great. Let's get into it. Cool. Okay. So I thought I'd take a, a step back first, some background. Um, so the whole idea of the patent system is that it's, it's, a, it's an agreement with the government and, and governments generally hate giving monopolies, uh, but they do recognise that innovation is important. And so, you know, in, in return for, uh, you know, you disclosing your innovation, the invention that you've made to the world, they will give you a 20 year monopoly. And, you know, in that 20 years, that's yours to do what you want with. But the idea is that you need to give society a disclosure that's commensurate in scope of the monopoly you've been given, such that when the, the patent expires, you know, potentially at the end of its 20-year term, it's a free-for-all. Anyone can use it and anyone can improve on it. And that's sort of called, I guess, that it's called the quid pro quo of the patent system. And the analogy I, I use when I'm talking with lawyers is it's, it's basically the consideration for a contract between the patentee and the government. Um, and 
that, that's been around for a long, long time, that requirement. And, and the Patents Act, this is, the, I guess, the sections of the Patents Act that, um, uh, that, that codify that. Um, there's a lot more requirements and specification to, to, to comply with, but basically I just wanted to home in on section 40, subsection 2. And section 2A is basically a sufficiency requirement and section AA is that the applicant must disclose the best method known to them uh, of performing the invention. The case I'm going to talk about um, in, in a few minutes touches on both of those, uh, but it was the best method known to the applicant of performing the invention that was, um, that, that was the, the problem here. And a, lot of, and a lot of people don't, um, you know, when they're coming to us for advice, and they'll, 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 they'll say, um, I need to copyright this, where really they, um, where they, really they need a patent, or yeah, they need yeah, to copyright yeah. this, and they really need a registered design. Or yes, I need to register this design, and really, it's a pattern. You know, there's a lot of misinformation. Just generally, I know in the public yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. sphere, amongst amongst um, you know even um, sophisticated individuals, uh, not knowing the difference you know between these and uh, where they cross over, perhaps, mm -hmm. and what um, and, and sometimes what they can and can't get protection for. Um, you know, I've found that really, really common over the last last few years. Um, and then not sort of knowing the differences and what uh, and why and, and why you would apply for one not the other and um, yeah, the relative costs and options etc. It's a it is definitely a, an area of law which um, it requires um, you know, experience with from guys like yourselves to to uh, to guide people through. And yeah, so yeah. when 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 they're um, when they're disclosing the best method, so why the best method? What's what's the what's that all about? Uh, so I guess it's the, the whole point of it is to put the put the uh, public in uh, in a position where they can perform the invention uh, once the patent ends, and the idea is that you need to give enough information to sufficiently describe the invention. So you know you've got a broad range of uh, you know material subject matter that somebody can draw on to to, to perform the invention, and importantly, you have to describe at the time of filing the application. The, the best way you know of of performing the invention. And it's so just not, an obligation. So not all of them, not all of the different ways, just the... No, 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 the yeah, yeah. So, so I'll, I guess I'll come to that in a few minutes, but, um, but, but yeah, it is, it's, it's, you know, it, it's what you have inevitably done is you, you know, you, you're performing an embodiment of the invention, one small facet of the invention, and uh, you need to describe that in extensive detail. Uh, you can't leave anything out and, uh, you know, you need to give a full and frank disclosure of, of what you've done to arrive at the, you know, the result that, that you say, you know, to arrive at the result, the effect of the, you know, that's the effect of the patent, the effect of your invention. And, and so with this new um, legislation coming in, well, I guess if we want to get in, get in before the deadline to get um, an innovation patent um, register, you, know, you think you'll see a flurry of these, um, start to come through before before the deadline. Yeah, the, the, these same sections apply to the to the innovation patents. Um, so it doesn't this doesn't really affect it. But yeah, I'm sure there's going to be an absolute flood of innovation patents filed over the course of the next year. Um, we'll certainly be recommending to all our clients that you know they they'd they be filing if there's something on the horizon. Mm. Cool. Okay, uh, I'll move along then. So that was the law and that's the last of uh, the Patents Act that I will show you. Um, and so just, just, just to sort of, I guess, just to set the scene. So patent claims are the, uh, the, the clauses at the end of the, the patent specification uh, and they're the part of the specification that every single patent attorney turns to first. Uh, and they're, you know, without doubt, the most important part of the specification because their function is to define the scope of the... Um, uh, of the monopoly that the patentee is seeking. But it's really important that you strike this balance between, the, the, between what you're disclosing and, uh, and the extent of you know, what you're claiming. Uh, if you're claiming something you know, really simple in scope, then you, know, you don't have to disclose too much. But if you're claiming some very broad class of you know, uh, that could potentially encompass millions of chemicals, for example, um, you know, you do need to have a disclosure that's commensurate with it. And this is, this is how I used to teach um, the, the drafting of patent um, 
uh, patent specifications course at UTS, and this is sort of the way I used to introduce students to it, uh, you know, to an illustration. And so that little blue dot in the middle is, um, you know, that inventor has made an invention. It's a tangible thing. It's a tangible product. And, you know, say, for example, it, it, you know, it's, it's a new mousetrap. But the reason you're getting a patent for that is that new mousetrap embodies an idea. There's some new concept. There's some new functionality there that, um, that you know, gives this mousetrap an advantage over existing mousetraps. And it'd be unfair if um, others were able to take advantage of that concept uh, but avoid the patent, you know, by doing something similar. Um, so what, what happens is that the, the patent should, you know, and I, I said it doesn't always, it should ideally cover all obvious variations of, um, of you know, of the, the inventor's product. And so what you end up having is you have you know, this little, you know, blue spot in the middle that, you know, is actually the physical product that the, the patentee has made. And you have this, this red line that is the scope of the monopoly. Uh, and so, you know, the monopoly is defined by the claims. So the words of the claims need to, um, you know, describe, uh, you need to define, you know, the, the size of that sphere, the circle rather. And the reason it's important, or there's a few reasons it's important, but it's, it's patent infringement. So if that's the scope of your monopoly and someone comes along and does something that falls right there where that red cross is, they're in trouble. They infringe your patent and you have recourse to them. But equally, if someone does comes along and does something that's out there outside of that circle where that green tick is, there's no infringement and you have no recourse to them. And uh, as a patent attorney, when this happens, you want to hope like heck that what that person, the green tick person, is doing is something that's you know different. It's it's you know something different that doesn't really take the um, doesn't really take the idea of what the you know inventor had, um, and, you know, and I guess. You, you know, if it doesn't, you're going to have a hard conversation with your client, you know, as to why you um, didn't, you know, why this thing that's taking the concept behind their invention, why that um, isn't, you know, covered by their patent. And do you, so, and do you find, and do you find when, when you're sort of looking at this sort of infringement stuff, um, you know, this, the, like, for instance, the power of a registered trademark or the power of a registered design, you know, if, if someone's coming to you with this, you know, with someone alleging a, a, a breach of a registered something, you know, piece of intellectual property, the conversation differs so greatly uh, between that and, um, you know, if they didn't have a registered patent or didn't have oh, a registered design, yeah. didn't have a registered trademark. Um, they, have, they have a right, you know, that you can, that, that's, that's, you know, that's sitting on the register, you know, at IP Australia and you can, um, you know, you can obtain, you know, everyone can see it. Uh, and that's where you start from. Whereas, you know, if they don't have a registered right, you know, I mean, trademarks and passing off, you know, as you'd well know, you know, effectively the same, not quite, of course, but effectively the same end result. But trademark infringement is, a, you know, many, many, many times easier to establish than, than passing off because you're starting from that registered right. And the yeah, and the stra and the and you, know, you can't sue for trademark infringement unless you've got a registered trademark. No, you can't no, sue no. for patent infringement unless you've got a registered patent. Same with registered no. design. Right. Um, and so then you've got you rely on all these other heads of damage, which aren't you know um, you, you know which is just they're not as easy to prove, right? And then um, right they, then they would be otherwise if you've got a, a registered a registered piece of intellectual property. Um, right, right. And it really comes. They're really coming from behind the eight As soon as, so, you know, and and this I'm learning more and more. And obviously, I don't um, you know advise so much in in relation to patent registered designs. But like you guys are here, um, you know. But um, yeah, I wanted to kind of get your thoughts as well on you know is is it, is it this is the same situation with patents and registered designs and people coming. Oh God, I've got um, someone chasing me. Um, you know, it's got a registered. It's um, you know. X and and they're saying that my Y thing is infringing on it. Um, you know, the, the once they've, if they've got that registered um, piece of intellectual property, the conversation changes so dramatically um, from my from my perspective. Looking very clearly, whether you know, because of the, that process and the cost of that process, and mm -hmm. really coming from behind the eight ball, or you know, or if you yeah, you're prosecuting that um, infringement. You've got such higher rights. You've got you know the process is quicker, faster. They're you know really much in your favour, um, you know, and 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 those that are you know although you still have to prove your your, your case as you know mm -hmm. as, as a plaintiff, um, there's just 
so much more power with that and the process is a lot more swift and um mm -hmm. and, you know and, and and cheap through the federal circuit court or circuit federal court um you know that's definitely something that I've, I've noticed more and more over over this time um and so i'm glad to know that's the same with patterns and registered designs yeah with registered designs you know um if you haven't if you haven't registered your design for your three-dimensional object like a chair or a, or a um you know wheelbarrow or whatever uh you, you have to rely on copyright but in that situation copyright's not available to you because uh because copyright it's not, it's not an infringement of, of, of someone's copyright to uh to make a three-dimensional object if, if, if the object if the object's been made into a three-dimensional thing then uh Copyright's not available, and copyright's free. Registered designs are not. You have to, you have to, you have to think ahead before you before you file your registered design, before you, yeah, before you before you produce your before you release your product, and, and show it to the market. Right, exactly. Otherwise, right. it becomes part part of the prior art base. Yep, that's right. Yep, that's exactly right. A good example on that as well as you know the, there was the fidget spinners that were probably was it last year or the year after a year before rather mm, that yeah. were just a mad craze and they were the subject of a u.s patent that the inventor elected not to pay the renewal fee for so the u.s you know the, the, the invention wow. was made you know uh you know probably 10 years ago uh the, the 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 patentee decided not to pay the renewal fee and the year after they became you know the craze that they were and she had no recourse to anyone because the patent had lapsed and was not restorable. What a shame. So it's a bit of a sad story, but you know, equally, you know, you've got to make these decisions. The, um, one of the ones that I heard was, um, we were up in, um, in Queensland, the guy that invented the louvers, um, you know, and it was an Australian invention. Australia's, Australia's got some great inventions, um, mm. as you know, over the years that we went through all of them. Um, mm. I think a lot of people would be surprised. Wow, that was from Australia. Um, yeah. But the guy that apparently invented the louvers um, didn't patent it, or, or I mean, uh, I guess there would have been potentially a, a, a design um, element too that he could have registered um, as well. Didn't register, didn't register it, and then used sure. all around the world. Yeah, there's, a big, there's, a, there's an example on uh, it used to be on IP Australia's website about Cambrook's uh, multi multi uh, GPO. Uh, uh, power outlet, right? The four, the four, four, um, the power board. Mm. That, that, that was an, that was Canbrook's idea, but they didn't they didn't uh, file any registered designs or patents for it. Bugger! And yeah. these are big big businesses. Yeah, sure, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Incredible. Sorry, Andrew, I keep interrupting you. You're right, I'll go a little bit. Love, love questions. Uh, I should just quickly apologise as well. I'm obviously working from home, and um, there's an OVO lesson going on in the background. Um, it's, it's a few rooms away, so hopefully it's okay. But just in case you hear a few, uh, a that's few okay. There was, there was someone vacuuming out here before, and I had to be on mute for the first part of it, <laughs> trying not to get annoyed uh, too visibly on the. On the <laughs> <laughs> nothing, nothing you can do. Okay, maybe, cool. maybe Lester will have a cockatoo. Yeah, cockatoo. Uh, that's right. Something more fast. <laughs> yes. Um, okay, so, so coming back into it, uh, so, so patent claims, uh, as patent attorneys, we're always looking to define inventions using functional language, um, and, and, and I'll show you an example uh, in, a, in, a, in a moment why we do that. Uh, and it's also permissible to claim by result in some circumstances. So you say you mix, you know, like, you know, mix a, a chemical A with a chemical B such that, um, you know, a gas is produced or something like that. And if you define a claim in that way, you can be vague about what chemical A and chemical B are. And patent attorneys love to be, you know, not vague, but love to be, you know, vague but clear, if you like, I guess, uh, because it just gives you nice, um, uh, nice broad claims. So I just want to take you really quickly through a, um, a, a claim drafting exercise. And again, this is one that um, I used to use at, uh, when I was teaching at UTS, just, just, to, just to give you an idea. And it is context for this, uh, for this case that we'll talk about in a few minutes. But it's just to give you an idea of uh, you know how how, to, uh, how attorneys go about drafting claims. So as I mentioned earlier on, it's the claims of the patent that define the scope of the monopoly. And in order to infringe the patent, you have to do something falling within the scope of the claim. So falling within the scope of that red circle I, I, I showed you earlier. Uh, and drafting claims is quite the art. So you've had a client come to you. Um, you know they've they've got this wonderful new invention. You ne you've never seen it before. They call it a paperclip uh, because it clips 
sheets of paper together. And as a patent attorney, you know, you know the first thing we ever do when we, when we start drafting a patent specification is we prepare the broadest claim. And we can claim this structurally, uh, you know, by saying it's a device for holding uh, paper pieces together, um, you know, which, which is what it is. Um, you know, and it comprises the length of wire. So it's made up of the length of wire that's bent at three locations, intermediate its ends. And it defines a half circle at each bend, such that in the final bent configuration, opposite ends of the wire are parallel to each other. So if you read through that claim and think about it, you see that like, you know, that, that paper clip is pretty well covered, um, you know, by, by that claim. And, you know, you may think, well, that's, that's a pretty good claim. Don't mind that one. And then a couple of years later, your inventor comes to you and says, hey, these people are using these things to hold sheets of paper together. And you do the analysis and you think, oh, oh dear, um, you know, because that's that green arrow that's sitting outside the scope of that claim, no infringement. And you've got a very uncomfortable conversation because that they are clearly, you know, obvious variants of, uh, you know, the, the paper clip, the wire paper clip that your, your client bought you a couple of years ago. So if we revisit the drafting experience, and this time we define it functionally. And what a paperclip is, is it's basically a spring. You know, you've just got two, two arms and a, and a biasing member between it. So if you, if you claim that functionally by saying a device for holding planar articles together, which is the same as we said earlier, but here you're saying, you're saying it comprises first and second members biased towards each other at a hinge region, such that when two or more planar articles are positioned between the members, they're held together. You've got a really nice functional claim there, and there's a bit of claiming by result as well. And the upshot of that is that all of these things would, you know, in theory, fall within the scope of that claim. So you've got, they're, they're all red crosses inside that red circle I showed you earlier on. Your client is really happy, and you have um, four letters of demand to send out. So the, the, you know, the reason I'm sort of emphasising that is that, like, it's really important, um, you know, to, to, in order to get your clients to the broadest possible monopoly uh, you want to claim functionally. But, and this is a big but, claims that define an invention functionally or, you know, a claim by result, um, you've, you've got to work harder to justify them. You've got to work harder to support the invention um, and especially outside of the mechanical arts. And I say that because if I say uh, something, you know, is, is a biasing, you know, something that biases one arm towards another, um, in the mechanical fields, there's only a limited number of ways that can be done. And, you know, they're all pretty straightforward. But if you move into like the chemical or electronic technologies, all of a sudden things don't work maybe the way you think they would. And all of a sudden there's an amazing different number of combinations and permutations. And suddenly, you know, it's not, it's not something that biases two things together. It's something that could, you know, you know, the, the examples you've shown show that it, it works in the way you say it does. But, you know, there, there are many, many, many examples that you can't ever get to uh, that may or may not work as you, as you show. So as you, if you claim using functional language, you need to, uh, your specification gets longer and longer and longer uh, in order to satisfy those um, sufficiency requirements. Um, but in all cases, as, as I mentioned earlier on, the best method known to the applicant for performing the invention must be included. Uh, and as I said at the outset, there's no place for, um, for secret source in, in the patent system. So that leads me into uh, the case I'd like to talk to you about. As I say, it came out um, uh, late last year. Um, so, you know, I appreciate it's well and truly not hot off the press, but, um, but, but it's, a, it's a pretty important case. And, and you know, I reread it um, just over the weekend. And, you know, it really is a shocking reminder to, to me as a patent attorney about the need to spill the secret source, you know, and it's, it's not spilling some of the secret source, it's spilling all of the secret source. And then it's important that you also leave the bottle upside down in the fridge if you need to, but upside down so you get the last little bits to drain out as well. You know, and I can't emphasize that enough. And, you know, I, you know you'll see how this, um, how Blue Scope um, Steel uh, didn't do very well out of this. Okay, so, the decision was uh, over 1,500 paragraphs long and the chemical technology is reasonably complicated. Uh, so I'm really trying to skim over the top of things here and sort of only delve into the technology uh, as I need to. 
I was a cyanide chemist, so you know I was in my element here, but 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 you know quite often was also quite bewildered by some of the um, some of the uh, evidence that was being uh, led. Um, so Blue Scope owned uh, two patents, uh, and they were for coating steel um, steel strips. Uh, and so you know, as you can imagine, steel. This is rolled steel here, but like you know, the steel strips they're used for for roofing products, uh, such as for example zinc loom. Um, it's a gazillion dollar industry, but um, steel loves nothing more than rusting. It's good and strong, but it loves to rust. And so you need to coat it and you need to have coatings on there that you know, stop it from rusting. Um, you know, Australia is a particularly harsh environment. You know, we don't have 150 degree days. You know, we've got pounding hailstorms. So you need to have a coating on that uh, steel strip um, that, um, that you know, stops it from, um, stops the steel inside from corroding. And th this patent was all about um, a hot dip coating method of, uh, of steel strips using uh, a particular alloy. Um, the, the other side, Don Cook Steel, uh, they're an overseas manufacturer. And what they were doing is they were exporting coated steel strips into Australia. Blue Scope alleged that they infringed and it was on for young and old in court. Um, so, as I say earlier, the first thing a patent attorney does when they, when they look at a patent is they turn to, um, turn to the claims. Um, and, you know, I look at this and perhaps Lester as well, I'm not sure, but I think this is a thing of beauty, a thing of wonder and beauty, uh, but most of the rest of the world looks at it and thinks, oh my goodness, they've butchered, butchered the English language. Um, but this is, this is what patent claims look like, uh, and this is what uh, the courts expect to see and what the examiners expect to see and what we spend, you know, 10 years of our lives training to, you know, to, to work out how to draft them. So, as I say, this is a, a hot dip coating method uh, and the, the method step is that the, the steel strip is passed through a hot dip coating bath that contains aluminium, zinc, silicon and magnesium uh, and, and the, the end result is an alloy coating is formed on the strip and this is really important. The alloy coating must have a variation in thickness of no more than 40% in any given 5 millimeter diameter section. And basically what's important is that they need to control variations in the thickness of the coating. And moving really sort of quickly through the, um, through the uh, description, basically uh, the reason it's important is that you, we've got magnesium and silicon in the alloy. Like we want magnesium and silicon because they have beneficial properties, but what they do, the pesky things, is they get together and they react to form uh, magnesium silicide. And magnesium silicide is bad because it, um, it, it does a couple of things. It causes mottling, uh, which basically, uh, probably not structurally, but aesthetically affects the surface. It gets dimples and it black spots and it doesn't look very nice. But also, and probably more importantly, it causes um, corrosion troughs and voids. Uh, and obviously, uh, troughs and voids in a, in a coating of a steel strip is, is a bad thing. Uh, your water and your elements are going to get in there and, you know, oh, there, there goes your corrosion. So magnesium is necessary, but it's a problem. And what the inventors found, and this, this is the, uh, you know, this, this is the discovery um, that they made, is that if you can minimise this coating thickness variation, you actually control how the magnesium silicide forms, if it forms, and you control its distribution. If you can keep magnesium silicide away from the surface, um, you don't get mottling and you, you have less risk, of, um, less risk of corrosion issues happening. And the specification sort of talks about that. And you know, the claim as you saw earlier is defined by result. So you, know, you do this, you, you dip this hot steel coating in an alloy bath in a way that results in controlling the, um, you know, the, the coating thickness. And the specification says that, you know, that there's, again, I'm simplifying things greatly here, but like, you know, there's two factors that affect the coating microstructure and how magnesium silicide uh, distributes. And one of those is the uniformness of the coating thickness across the strip surface. And unfortunately, all the specification says about how you go about doing this is using these special operational measures. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, anyone that was involved with this case um, has nightmares whenever they see those words. But basically, all that 
the specification. The specification teaches that it's essential to control the thickness of the coating, uh, you know, particularly variations of the thickness. But all it says about how you go about doing this is to use these special operational measures. Uh, and basically, the, um, the whole case turned on this. These three words in a, in a patent specification and you know, uh, I don't, I, I hate to imagine how much this case cost and this is what they turned on. So special operational measures, uh, they weren't further described in the patent specification at all. And Blue Scope uh, spent about um, 200 uh, paragraphs of the decision arguing that these special operational measures were part of um, what's called the common general knowledge of a person skilled in the art. And, and basically, to summarise, that means that someone that works in the art of metallurgy, if told that they had to, you know, uh, control the variation of coating thickness, they know, you know, they, they've been around the game for a while, they know what they could do to do that, and they would, they would understand that, okay, you know, I, I, I would just need to do this or this, and that would achieve that result. Uh, and, and, and really interestingly as well, Blusco, when they filed this patent application, they hadn't actually performed the invention. They... They, knew, they thought they knew how it would work, but you know, as you can imagine, it's not a simple thing to, you know, to, to go and get a bit of hot rolled steel and dip it into an alloy dip and, and make measurements and draw you know, firm conclusions. You can't make prototypes you know, with a 3D printer or something like that. So they thought they knew how it worked and you know, the, you know, they thought with putting, you know, describing the special operational measures that they thought they had provided the best method, best method but they hadn't actually performed it. Um, and um, in evidence, they actually gave, you know, four examples of these of special operational measures that they could have used. But a couple of those were, you know, in evidence, um, they were part of the common general knowledge. Uh, and, you know, they sort of led arguments that, oh, look, you know, we didn't need to disclose because they are part of the common general knowledge. Um, Don Cook Steele obviously argued the, the other way, uh, as tends to happen in these sort of uh, argy-bargies. And they were saying basically that, you know, they weren't part of the, car, the, the common general knowledge uh, and that even if there were use of the word special, you know, would sort of, you know, if, if you say it's special operational measures, you think it's something over and above what I might know. And uh, so you don't go looking to, to what's in the common general knowledge. So, you know, use of the word special there had, um, you know, horrific consequences. Um, and they also argued that, you know, it was incumbent on Bluescope to disclose what measures they expected would be needed, uh, you know, and, and that stands regardless of whether or not, um, uh, you know, they'd actually put it into practice or not. The evidence showed that Bluescope did know what they thought would work and did have a, you know, a business plan to, to put this into effect, obviously taking a few years to do just because of the, the you know, the... the um, you know, the, I want to say the lab setup, but of course it's not a lab setup. It's a, a massive thing with you know, two thousand degree uh, metal coming through it, so it's not an easy thing to do. Um, and there was an absolutely horrific amount of technical evidence, like you know, uh, just just things that I just you know boggle the mind um, that, that had to be done to sort of produce evidence here. And of course, each side's experts disagree with each other, you know, vehemently and everything else. Um, and um, the result was that um, Bluescope was deemed not to have disclosed the, uh, the best method of performing the invention. And these valuable patents that were novel, inventive, and satisfied all other requirements for patentability, uh, including sufficiency, because what the court decided was that um, they, the person skilled in the art would have an idea about something that might work, and so would have sort of fill that gap, if you like, the, um, you know, the special operational procedure that wasn't, um, spe sorry, special operational measures that weren't disclosed, they would have had an idea about perhaps how to, how to go about that. And in doing that would have, you know, done something that arrived at some form of the invention. So that, that they, they got away with that. Um, but because they didn't disclose the best method, um, they, um, the, the patent was revoked. Um, what did they say? So, I mean, the court said that, um, uh, a, couple, a couple of reasons, there were four reasons, and just quickly summarising. Uh, the evidence showed that, uh, so Bluescope showed that there were four examples of um, special operational measures that, you know, that, that they'd envisage using. The court showed that two of them weren't common general knowledge, so, you know, couldn't, couldn't be accessed and so couldn't ever form part of a best method. 
uh, and um, the other two sort of wouldn't wouldn't have been, you know, I guess, you know, you wouldn't have known that they're going to work. And because they'd used the word, you know, special operational measures, you wouldn't have gone looking, the person skilled in the art wouldn't have gone looking for them. Um, so, you know, that, that was a, a pretty bad ending for them. And it actually got worse because under the laws at the time, uh, Bluescope would have been allowed to amend the application to include these special operational measures. Uh, but because it was in court proceedings, that requires the discretion of the court. And uh, for, for a number of reasons that probably aren't particularly relevant to this talk, they were um, refused that leave. And so this amendment that could be made to perhaps remedy this, this whole issue to make this patent valid uh, couldn't be made. And um, the, you know, the, the patent was revoked. Um, so just, yeah, just, just quickly, just to you know, take home messages, you know, as I said earlier on, you just need to put everything into the patent specification um, when it's drafted. And, uh, you know, and as information comes to hand, uh, you really need to, um, to, you know, to, to add to it, you know, if it's at all possible to do so. So yeah, spill the secret sauce. Hopefully that didn't get too technical. No, it's great, and um, thanks for thanks for making it not uh, not technical, which sounds like a okay, very, good. very technical decision. I can't imagine the expert evidence uh, and trying to wade through that. Fifteen hundred paragraphs, um, unbelievable. And so, um, were they? Do you think they might have been trying to make it, you know, sort of broad enough to kind of cover all of those at the time when they when when they filed it, and and that yeah. perhaps was the down the downfall because they hadn't got to that. Yeah, I, I thought the decision was perhaps a little bit unfair, especially the amendment decision. Um, the court was sort of, you know, one of the, one of the reasons they said, you know, was an issue was because they sort of they, they said there was no full and frank disclosure. But um, I don't know. I mean, I, I I think the patent attorney gave you know work with the information that he was given, and um, you know didn't didn't mislead the court at all. Um, you know and. and they, this, this, this application had corresponding applications in other countries and amendments weren't needed in any other countries, just explanations, submissions persuaded the examiners to allow it. I, I really you know, don't know that I would have done much different. Mm -hmm. And I guess uh, that disclosing that process, the, you know, how, how it is done, you know. Yeah. So, you know, so that there isn't any there isn't any secret sauce. There's no nothing hidden. No, no. But I don't. Think, I mean, they didn't even think they were keeping, you know, not spilling the secret sauce. It didn't feel like, you know, it was just that they just described, okay, well, this is what we could do, and you know, in, mm. in hindsight, obviously, they they should have put them in. And the amendments they wanted to make to to spill the secret sauce was less than a page, so it wasn't like they withheld, you know, fifteen hundred paragraphs of you know really important data. It was a page of. These are the, these are what you could do to you know to control the uh, coating thickness on a you know like on a zinc alum um, steel strip you know sorry a zinc alum coated steel strip. Mm. Amazing. It's a good example how you know even the even the big guys um, you know can can get it wrong when it comes yeah, down yeah, to yeah yeah it's only to getting it wrong in hindsight. Like, I don't think you know, there was no no lack of due diligence on you know the part of the attorney and. Mm. Oh, excellent. So uh, if you guys want to get in contact with you, here are your contact details. Yes. Um, and so found, yeah. Foundry IP, um, um, you know, specialise in this, in this, in these areas. Um, um, we've found them to be excellent for our clients to, to, to refer them to, to for this specific um, area. It's really technical. It's highly specialised. Um, you know, the, I, I've noticed as well, there's even some, you know, sort of patent um, attorneys that specialise just in, you know, in the building industry, doing this type of machinery stuff. This is how, how specialised, you know, you, you can you can go with this. Um, I realised fairly early on. Um, yeah, how, okay. how, yeah it's, it's just such a technical area. Um, um, and so um, here's all um, Foundry's uh, contact details here, the website, foundryip.com.au. Um, and Lester, Andrew, and Kieran's um, email addresses. Kieran's going to give us a um, a further follow up um, on his part of the presentation, uh, which we'll tack on to the end of this, so that um, so that everyone has that as well. Unfortunately, I had something uh, urgent come up today. 
Um, but thanks so much um, to both of you, Andrew and Lester, for, for being here today. Um, it's been fantastic. Uh, thanks a lot, no, Andrew. Thanks very much. Very enjoyable. Having Thank you. Good to see you again. And uh, yeah, hopefully, when the, whenever the next uh, cases come out, that uh, and maybe Lester might even do an update of where where things are at with uh, with designs as things move on and what's uh, for sure what's being proposed to keep everyone up to date. For sure, love to. Thanks so much, and um, appreciate your valuable time. Pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you. Take it easy, Ian. Bye. Cheers, Dan. Bye.